Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Nancy Murr, uh, the communications coordinator here at OLLI. Today, appropriately, during Women's History Month, uh, we are delighted to welcome Mary Hughes, who will discuss, among other things, um, how and why the San Francisco Bay Area has produced uh, the most powerful women in American politics and how we, we can keep doing that. Um, Ms. Hughes is the founder of Close the Gap California, a statewide campaign to recruit and support progressive women running for office uh, with the goal of finally, finally uh, achieving a uh, gender balance in, in the legislature and in Congress. She has been a political strategist for many years um, and has advised candidates for president, Congress, uh, state and legislative office contributing to a number of groundbreaking firsts. Uh, first woman in US history to lead her party in the Congress, first woman superintendent of schools in California, and uh, first open lesbian judge elected in the nation. So just a little bit of housekeeping before I turn this over to Mary. Um, Mary's gonna talk for about 45 or 50 minutes and we'll share her beautiful slides. And then we'll open up the floor to questions. If you just pop your questions in the chat box, she'll be able to go through them that way. And, and that might uh, speed things along a little bit. So, uh, and you can do that at any point during her talk. So without further ado, Mary, I'm delighted to hand this off to you. Thank you. Well, thank you and thank everyone at Ollie. I'm delighted to be here. Um, it's a great way to start Women's History Month and uh, fun to be with you all. So thank you for this lovely invitation. Before I start, I also want to thank very much um, my colleague, Elizabeth Grubb from Cal, who has helped me to put this together. Elizabeth, I couldn't have done it without you. So thanks very much. Um, it is true that I have been at the business of electing women for 37 years here in the Bay Area. And for much of that time, um, I have had this question on my mind over the years. It became very clear to me that there was a secret sauce to what was happening here in the Bay Area, something different and unique and that has been borne out over time. So it's great fun for me, who as a strategist and operative do not pretend today to be a historian, but I very much am excited to share with you my notions about um, how the Bay Area produced these extraordinary leaders. Um, and we're gonna do two things. We're gonna look a little bit at the women themselves because frankly, a great deal of the answer lies there. But the answer also lies in the issues, the events, the trends um, that propelled them forward um, into the powerful positions they held and hold. So our story starts um, actually quite a while ago. It starts on a really hot week in San Francisco in 1984 at the Democratic National Convention. Walter Mondale had selected Geraldine Ferraro to be his running mate and the excitement around that was extraordinary. It was doubly interesting for San Franciscans because Ferraro had been chosen over Mayor Feinstein, who was graciously welcoming the delegates, working to make the city hospitable. And there was so much excitement among the women in the Bay Area. And I would say, with the exception of one, uh, one person who I'll talk to you about in a moment, this was really the beginning of stirring that alchemy that created the infrastructure and the movement energy and the purpose that is now the Bay Area. And it really took us from that aspiration of believing there could be a woman vice president to having a woman vice president. It was just an extraordinary time. But the important piece, which we'll come back to, is the way it coalesced women around the possibilities of power. 
how they could go from believing there could be a woman vice president to actually nominating one. And that was um, an extraordinary beginning. And of course, we all are still celebrating in part where it took us. And one a fascinating side story, uh, perhaps we can talk about in the questions, is the way that Kamala was the beneficiary of so much that happened between then and now, and how that architecture and infrastructure allowed her to go far fast. Wonderful stories embedded in all these stories. Now, don't get bleary eyed. This is uh, an illustration just to point out to you the place in history that we'll be looking. And we're going to look mostly at the 1990s. And as you can see, there are big clusters of women running for the legislature. We have early mayors and late mayors, not a lot of mayors during the the intense period of electoral activity for the women. And today we're going to focus on those women who were are in Congress and were in Congress. Um, I think that what I, I wanna take one moment to recognize, as I said earlier, the rise of Bay Area women and the, uh, the, the reason that much of the country thinks of this as a feminist capital, actually that seed was sown back in 1975 by a woman named Janet Gray Hayes out on the left edge of your slide. You can see that in, she was elected in 1975, uh, elected mayor of San Jose. And when she was elected, there were no men on her city council. And when I was reading about Janet, her daughter said, it was very clear to my mother, she was not wanted. This was an aberration that she was mayor. She set about electing women in San Jose, recruiting them, identifying them. So within the next six to eight years, there was a majority female, uh, a female majority on the city council and the board of supervisors in Santa Clara County was also a majority female leading US News and World Report to say that San Jose was the feminist capital of the world. And that was a little seed that was sown before our 84 convention, but which continued to grow during all these years. These are the congressional women that we will spend um, the balance of our time with looking at understanding and seeing how they interacted with the, um, the events of their time to build this support structure for each other. The first thing I would say to you is they are listed here as they went to Washington, DC. So Barbara Boxer was first in 1982, elected from Marin when John Burton stepped down. Um, almost all of these women are broke barriers. They are almost all the first women to hold the titles that are here on the screen for them. Um, they broke other barriers as well, which we'll talk about as we go along. They became, they took their issues with them to Washington, but most of them were motivated by the same basic ideals that come from family and community. And I mention this because there is an unusual commonality among women leaders. And this was true, I was very surprised when I was reading Barbara Boxer, a biography of Barbara Boxer. One of the things that was interesting was that what brought Barbara into contact with government and got her interested in government was the, the lack of a stop sign on the way to school. And she wanted to figure out how do I get a stop sign so my kids are safe? And that was her first contact. What's interesting about that, when I read the biography of Janet Gray Hayes, the mayor in San Jose I just mentioned to you, she was motivated because she needed a crossing guard. And I thought that is so unusual until I read the biography of um, 
the first woman governor, her name is going to escape me in Vermont. And the stop sign came up again. And I, I have been fascinated by what it is that is that mini catalyst that draws these women to say, I need to get this done. How am I going to get this done? That is a common theme for all of them. I need to get this done. How am I going to get this done? They are remarkably productive. So in the case of Barbara, she took her environmental uh, credentials, her commitment. Um, she really was just uh, uh, a spark of energy that sort of lit them all and lifted them up. Sala Burton went to Congress when she succeeded her husband, Phil, after he died. She stayed only briefly, and I, my apologies for the power position, but she immediately, and this is very interesting, she did not hold public office before, uh, before she went to Congress, but she understood, having been at Phil Burton's right hand the entire time, she understood Congress, she knew how it worked, and the leadership in Congress knew that and put her immediately on the Rules Committee, which is a coveted position in the House. When Sala died, she had actually said, and a, a press release was um, distributed, uh, that she wanted Nancy Pelosi to succeed her. So in a special election in 1987, uh, Nancy Pelosi uh, went to Congress. Um, and then we arrive at the 1992 election. And this is um, extraordinarily important to the Bay Area because a great deal of the energy of 84 and the focus of the women who made that convention extraordinary actually resurfaces in a big way. The conventional wisdom in 1992 is it is impossible, impossible for two Jewish women from the Bay Area to be elected to the Senate together. Can't happen. It does happen. And those women made it happen. And along with them, Anna Eshoo and Lynn Woolsey, Lynn Woolsey from Marin, the vice mayor of Petaluma, and an issue a supervisor from San Mateo is elected for the first time again, breaking all sorts of barriers, the first woman to represent the peninsula. She is followed shortly by Zoe Lofgren. Um, Zoe in a special election again defies the odds. She runs as the underdog to the former mayor, Tom McHenry, and she beats him by 1100 votes. Then in, that's in 94 and 96, Ellen Tauscher never having held public office, her involvement as you'll see, um, uh, her connection to the women, she has served as a chair of the Feinstein Finance Committee and has come into politics that way. She is in her own right, one of the first women to hold a seat on the stock exchange before coming to California. She has only been here for two or three years when she runs for Congress in the last district held by a Republican in the Bay Area. And we'll talk more about what prompted her to go, but suffice it to say, she won that election with less than 50% of the vote and by a percentage point. Barbara Lee then follows when Ron Dellums uh, her boss uh, and longtime mentor um, leaves the Congress in 98. And then many, that is our contingent for many years. Then Jackie Spear follows to Washington in, um, in 2008 and Kamala uh, in 2016. So this is who they are. They have a, a storied and wonderful history as a group. And there are many things that connected them in their work. But what's important, I think, before we go on, is just to take a minute and appreciate how they went where no other women have gone, heading committees and subcommittees, becoming the first whip, the first leader, the first speaker of the House, and then, of course, the first vice president. So we're going to look at a little bit about what about them personally is um, is interesting because there are three things that I think that we wanna think about. They were prepared, 
what does that mean for the group and each of them? They were connected to each other in multiple ways, very unusual, but they are connected. And they were accomplished before they went, which enabled them to rise as quickly as you saw that they did to positions of leadership. It's interesting, I think, to note um, that um, only four of them are native to the Bay Area. The Bay Area, unlike other places in the United States, does not demand of its elected officials that you're quote unquote from here. Um, that doesn't seem to be important to our voters since many of them are not from here. And that, that obviously paved the way for some of them. What is, was surprising to me and interesting is how many of them were congressional or state legislative staffers. And here I'm gonna go back and forth. And if you just look at the list on under pre-election involvement, you can see here that Zoe was a staffer for her predecessor, Don Edwards. And Jackie was a staffer for Leo Ryan. And back to Barbara who worked for John Burton. And uh, Nancy, uh, or Anna who worked for Anna Eshoo, who worked for Leo McCarthy. These women all studied, and I do mean that literally, they studied the craft of legislating. They, their interest in public service was first in their own service. And that was true. Diane was on the California Women Parole Board appointed by Pat Brown. Um, the, they had, um, and I, uh, I don't think it's too strong a word, they had a reverence for this work. They knew that it was important and they knew that they needed to understand it before they, they ran. They all had mentors. The Burtons played a big role in this, Phil and John Burton, um, particularly with Barbara, Nancy, obviously with Sala to a lesser extent um, uh, with Anna. Um, they were um, very supportive. And I just want to quote here because I think it's such a lovely quote. Um, our current treasurer, Fiona Ma from San Francisco, has often said John Burton has encouraged more women to run for office in the Bay Area than anyone else. And he's been there to support them, which I think is a lovely thing. Most all of them were mentored by, as you can see, by men. Um, but Diane was a mentor uh, to Ellen Tauscher, which is a lovely thing. So they were well prepared. Before they ran for lower offices, they worked for people who modeled for them what it is to be a good public servant and representative. Um, they all shared women as allies, but each of them had a devotion to an issue that made it more likely um, that they had uh, a strong bases of support from which to run. And then um, I want to point out one other thing before moving on, which isn't much talked about. In the far right column, you can see who lost races. Nancy lost a race for chair of the Democratic National Committee. Diane lost three races. She lost twice for mayor and once for governor. Anna lost two races, once um, when she first started for community college board and once for Congress for the seat that she now holds. And Jackie lost twice, once for Congress and once for Lieutenant Governor. And I highlight this because when you're celebrating the success of people, we very often gloss right over the bumps, the speed bumps. And I would offer to you in my study of these women, the speed bumps gave them enormous confidence. And here's what I mean. To know losing is just venturing something so you can keep doing the work and that you're gonna keep doing the work. So losing really isn't that big a deal if you're devoted to these issues. And they all are. And that those losses actually set each one of them up 
to subsequently succeed, which is really an important thing, particularly for women to understand about the process of running and winning, although sometimes running and losing. In many ways, they modeled the entrepreneurs that came to Silicon Valley who said, if you haven't failed once a day, you're not trying. These women were game and are game. They were willing to venture a lot. Um, and that wasn't always the norm. Now, as I mentioned, they came into politics post 84, beginning of the 90s, and they were blessed with networks that were full of women leaders who were already building in the Bay Area. And here's what I mean. In Planned Parenthood and the National um, Abortion Rights Action League were highly charged at the beginning of the 90s. Roe had won reproductive rights for women, but they were under attack. What the Webster decision cut back that freedom and gave states the right to do some restrictions. And then the Casey decision followed in 92. And there was a great deal of concern about whether or not we would be losing more and more of reproductive freedom for women. These are were um, these groups were highly active in the original elections of the women we're talking about today. Um, I uh, received staff from Planned Parenthood on behalf of one uh, of these women who worked in the campaign. They were in kinded to us. There was no uh, distance between the women who were running and winning and the women who were working on reproductive rights. That was also true in the in the, the in environment, which surprised me a little bit. Um, but I have the, um, the sense that um, the early women who formed Save the, Day, the Bay in the 60s, um, the Committee for Green Foothills, similarly, Audrey Rust, who ran Post. By the early to mid 90s, polls were showing that everyone in the Bay Area identified as an environmentalist. And those organizations, particularly the hyper-local ones, like Committee for Green Foothills, were, were staffed, supported, and run by women. Those women also weighed into these races and as advocates on behalf of these issues. The same was true of domestic violence. Futures Without Violence, which is now well established in the Presidio as an international leader on um, the prevention of domestic violence, the management, uh, judicial response. Esther Solar, the founder, uh, was extremely active uh, early on and in this period of the 90s actually was an advisor and advocate with Joe Biden to write um, the, um, the bill um, preventing um, uh, violence against women, the Violence Against Women Act, which I think passed in 94. And then of course, there were the national organizations that found kinship with the women in the Bay Area and built national bases largely from here. So the Women's Campaign Fund, which is bipartisan, founded in 1974, we had two women uh, activists in the Bay Area, Sissy Swig and Ann Halstead, who were on the board. Uh, and, and lifted up the visibility of, of women running here in our area. Emily's List founded in 84, 85 to support Mikulski was huge in all four of those 92 races that Diane and Barbara and Anna Eshoo and Lynn Woolsey won, pumping money in. And in 1992, they became the largest funder of Democratic women. I think they spent, raised and spent $6.4 million in 92 to make a difference. Of course, the National Women's Political Caucus founded, I think, in 78, and now were also present and longstanding. But these groups came together with their issue interests, their commitment to women to create a network and an architecture, a political infrastructure for women here that was extraordinary and supported all of the women that we are talking about. So it was 
the women themselves, their preparation, the um, ideological kinship they shared with their districts here in the Bay Area, their connections to each other, but, but it was also this network that lifted them up. But that wasn't all. The go-go 90s were an extraordinary time when social movements, the tech boom, generational change was making a huge difference uh, in the Bay Area. And I wanna tell you just a few stories from this period that will explain why and how um, these movements also helped to list these, lift up these 11 women and help them break these barriers. Around this same time, uh, 1990 in San Francisco, um, something happened that was very unusual. In the ele that election in June and in the fall, there was something that came to be known as the Lavender Sweep. It was started with the, the candidacy uh, of a civil rights lawyer by the name of Donna Hitchens. Uh, Donna was also the founder of um, the Center for Lesbian Rights. And um, she challenged a sitting judge, hadn't happened in, in 25 years. And we started every one of her campaign meetings by acknowledging that we were highly unlikely to win the race. But she had um, been out front for women getting into the fire department in San Francisco. She had been an advocate for um, women's advancement and she found that same network was right there when she ran. She won a surprise victory with the huge margin of 540 plus or minus votes uh, in the June election and found herself on the front of the advocate, the National LGBTQ magazine. It was huge influx of energy for the gay community where in the fall election, Carol Migdon and Roberta Actenberg were then elected to the Board of Supervisors and Tom Amiano went to the Board of Education. That lavender sweep brought in to the women's movement and uh, supportive infrastructure, the gay community in ways that it hadn't been before, such that when the marriage initiative later in the, uh, the 2000s went on the ballot, there was obvious and ample support from the women's community. So that kind of injection of energy happened at the electoral level. The tech boom that was taking place uh, in the Bay Area, but largely in Silicon Valley, drew an influx of talent, um, an explosion of wealth, and as we'll talk about in a minute with the election of the very young president and vice president. Um, I think Bill Clinton was 46 when he was elected and Al Gore. Similarly, Clinton was the third youngest president at the time to be elected. There was a generational explosion of energy that fueled the tech boom along with this influx of talent. And it was something that these women elected officials were very aware of. They understood and stayed very close to their constituencies and could see what the possibilities were. Now, it didn't take long over the course of the 90s for the ubiquitous uh, WWW Worldwide Net to be um, an extremely uh, uh, present in all of our lives and especially here in the Bay Area. But the necessity that a new and rising industry would need advocates in Washington, that it would need the support for research and development from the government, that it would need pub public private partnerships to grow at a clip that to maximize this new industry. The women who represented the Bay Area understood that, worked together to advance that, and learned to uh, ride the rocket ship, if you will, to take it as a calling card for what made California and California leadership important in the Congress. So this became a very important piece 
of the rise of the women, if you will. This generational change with the year of the woman, what I all I want to note here is that the year of the woman was not lost on the administration. And that was very clear um, in the appointments that were made. You know, now, the, especially with the Obama and now Biden administrations, these may not seem like groundbreaking moments to us, but indeed they were. When Janet Reno was named attorney general, huzzas everywhere. Who could imagine such a thing? More firsts for women. The same was true and perhaps even more so with Madeleine uh, Albright uh, as Secretary of State in the second administration. Again, an infusion of energy for the women's movement. We can do this. We can make this happen. And then of course, and now um, a, a heart, sort of heart-wrenching for all of us, the appointment of Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, to the Supreme Court. So again, these go-go 90s have a whole lot, a whole lot going for them. Um, I, I wanna just touch on a few moments of culture that both reinforced and worked to really imprint this change. No going back. Uh, Toni Morrison won the Mo Nobel Prize for Literature. Uh, the businesses that were rising in the Valley by the middle to end of the 90s, uh, Carol Bartz was the CEO of Autodesk. Meg Whitman was running eBay um, and Carly Fiorina was running uh, HP. So business was not immune to this movement that was infiltrating all sectors. Also, uh, wonderful changes in sport. It, the 90s, um, Serena Williams at 14 goes pro. The NBA hires its first woman uh, referee. And uh, to the delight of soccer fans everywhere, uh, in 1999, the U.S. women win the World Cup. Really, just a, again, explosion of awareness of women's capacity. Um, true in arts and entertainment, the real seeds are sown here for the women directors of now uh, building on the, their shoulders. So um, I, I want to not race, but I want to make sure we get to talk together, all of us. Um, I want to talk to you uh, about really three catalytic events. Um, we've talked about the convention, but I just want to remind you that many of those women were peers of the women, uh, the 11 who were elected, especially the six or seven during the 90s. And so um, this, they are full participants and developing all sorts of organizations here in California to hurry the election of women to local and state office. That strain is carried through. But I wanted to mention three things, uh, three catalytic events in the 90s that played out again building on what we have in the Bay Area and spurring on the election of more women. The first was 1990 Earth Day. It was the 20th anniversary of the original Earth Day. We have a strong environmental ethic in the Bay Area. They headquartered that effort in Palo Alto. Uh, it was run by um, uh, a very savvy political woman, Chris Desser. Uh, and from San Francisco. And the, the interesting piece here is there was a split among the environmentalists. The Earth Day that was centered here welcomed the participation of the new industrial, uh, the rising tech world and corporations. To many in the environmental movement, that was anathema and they split off. And so there were two strains in that celebration, but the one that welcomed the, um, the corporate participation was able to put down a marker, building on global warming and introducing the idea of climate change and sustainability as a responsibility across all sectors for all of us. And that is something that has, a, has had a slow growth uh, and that many of our women have been advocates for. The social responsibility um, that includes sustainability. 
there is almost no way to describe it unless you lived through the 1991 testimony of Anita Hill, and many of you may have. Um, it was an extraordinary moment in time when um, uh, the notion of speaking truth to power was never more visibly or beautifully displayed. But what struck the women of the country was the all male judiciary committee and the injustice of no one being able to share the perspective of Anita Hill as she spoke. Um, that caused a huge number of women to run for office who would not have otherwise chose, chosen to do so, and a huge number of women to get out and vote, many of them voting for women up and down the ticket. 1996 Net Day is something that you um, may have forgotten about, but it's symbolic in the way that it knitted together government, industry, education, the women elected and the Bay Area. Um, by 1996, um, it was clear that all education needed to include the internet, but schools were not wired. So a day was declared on which everyone would be invited to pull wires in the schools. And sure enough, the president and vice president showed up in Concord, California uh, to pull wire. And they uh, did so elected officials across the country and up and down the, the, the Bay Area also pulled wires, celebrated the integration of the internet into schools, education, and therefore into the larger culture. This was just one more way, another way that we were a, sort of um, a path. If you imagine one of those airline planes when you're flying showing you how far you've gotten, there was one of those well-trod roads uh, between Washington and Silicon Valley. The first trip Al Gore made in the new administration in 1993 was to Silicon Valley. Um, and that, uh, as I say, spurred a great deal of growth, direction, and action um, among these women. I'm gonna run through 10 lessons and then we'll get to sharing some ideas together that I learned in studying the women and this context in which each of them came into their own as a legislator and a leader. Purpose is fundamental. These women on, not only understood their motivations and, they, and we can talk about them if they interest you for public service, but they also had a specific intent. When I said early on, they needed to get things done, they wanted to get things done, they were very close to their constituents and they knew people needed government, that there was a role for government to play. And their, their purpose is their North Star. Sometimes it's the North Star out on the horizon that says, I need a bigger platform to do what I need to do. I think, for example, that Nancy Pelosi, when the victories of 92 immediately turned into the Gingrich Revolution of 94, I believe it was that very moment when Speaker Pelosi decided, you know what, we're not doing this. And, and if I have to get out there on point and make a change, I'll do that. And she never stopped until she did. Her purpose was fundamental. She needed to put the country in a different direction. Apprenticeship matters. I've talked to you about the fact that each of these women actually studied the, the role of the legislator and how this work gets done. Um, there are lots of ways to be an apprentice in government. It's not just the internships, uh, they matter and they're important, but it matters to have a good mentor. It matters that you understand how the work gets done. It matters that you understand what part of the work you're good at. All of them did. Um, 
I pointed out, I highlighted that some of them weren't always successful. What they share as a group and what you'll find um, among their colleagues in the advocacy world as well is the quality of resilience. A no isn't a no, it's just a yes delayed. That's how they operate. They don't take no for an answer. They are resilient. Even when uh, you lose a big, a big race, they, they recover because winning is not the point. The work is the point. You do the winning so you can do the work. So they never lost sight of that. What was also interesting, five of the 11 served on boards of supervisors. And in some way, boards of supervisors proved a more direct route to Congress than um, going through the state legislature. Two of them served in the state legislature, Barbara Lee and Jackie, but Jackie was also uh, on a board of supervisors, as was Barbara, as was Diane, uh, Anna, uh, Jackie, and um, I'm forgetting, but there was one other. So it, I, I pointed out, because I think that in the stair steps up to, um, to Congress, people um, often overlook that possibility. Um, each of these women knew their people. Uh, they had worked with the healthcare community in Anna's case, the environmental community in Barbara Boxer's case. They knew, um, uh, it's interesting, I haven't spoken a lot about Kamala and that's in part because Kamala's trajectory uh, was long in the state and short and, and a big burst on the federal scene. But one of the ways that Kamala uh, learned her craft and learned how to, how to work and bring women together was through that very seed of Estes Solar's domestic violence work, which Kamala then took into the trafficking work that she did both as an attorney general and the work that, um, that she cared about throughout actually her law enforcement life. Um, social change and demographic shift equals opportunity. It's good to have all the right stuff inside you you have got to read your environment and read the horizon. When 1992 occurred, the vice mayor of Petaluma, Lynn Woolsey, may not have thought of herself as a member of Congress. And then she did. She saw what happened with Anita Hill and the response to it. And she was the one, one of the women who said, I can do this and stepped forward. She ended up running, by the way, in a Democratic primary where all or all but one of her eight opponents were men, which I think was also helpful in that environment result in, in the social change. Ellen Tauscher was the biggest beneficiary of demographic shifts. The Bill Baker district that she took, the last Republican district, it had been getting slowly, slowly, slowly more blue than red. And she was uh, recruited by uh, uh, Emily's List, Judy Cantor, a wonderful um, Emily's List advocate and fundraiser here in the Bay Area, took some research to her that said that a lot of the women in 92 had won because they matched their suburban districts. Those districts were uh, fairly well off, the uh, electorate was better educated than the norm, and they were open to electing women. The combination of that demographic shift of voters in her district over time and her profile enabled her after two years to become a member of Congress from California. Um, read the zeitgeist. This, uh, the combination of tech energy and um, women's energy in the 90s, the generational change that Clinton Gore brought to the national scene, all came together to give the Bay Area in California a sort of mystique with many members of Congress. Speaker Pelosi understood that. She brought them here to visit the various the sites where companies, finance companies, biomedical companies um, were, were using technology to change the way they did business. This gave the, the, um, the 
caucus of our women in the Bay Area, cachet in Washington to be part of this and to use this as a way to bring this knowledge and information, but also to pass the legislation necessary to build the industry and our area. Seize the moment. Nobody seized a moment better than Barbara Boxer charging ahead of six of her colleagues up the stairs of the Senate to demand that Anita Hill be heard. And that icon iconic picture was uh, previous uh, on a previous slide, but seizing that moment instilled and in people and reminded them when she first ran for Congress, Barbara ran under the slogan, Barbara Boxer gives a damn. That picture just reinforced that slogan. Barbara Boxer gives a damn. And it made the difference in a very tight primary. Mutual aid provide mutual benefits. I won't be able to do this justice, but here's what I mean. This is not, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. This is Dianne Feinstein, who backed a different candidate in the race for Congress that Barbara Boxer won. And Barbara Boxer, who backed a different candidate for governor, in the race that Dianne Feinstein lost. Finding a way in 1992, post their nominations, to come together and campaign together and use their very different personas to lift them up as a team, such that the press ended up dubbing them the Thelma and Louise of 1992. It's an interesting and wonderful story uh, about highs and lows and um, uh, what it takes to keep in mind what the goal is, always what the goal is and how we do our work. To go far, go together. You know the old saying, I put it here because I just wanted to end our conversation or end this part of the presentation by saying that I do believe that when um, real historians with um, a farther look back, look at the rise of Kamala Harris. They will see what the members of Congress and the senators had built on which she could rise, how they supported her, what she had to work with so that she could go farther, faster. But they all came up together and both are necessary for, for women to continue um, uh, to get to the rightful places at the table. So I'll stop there and thank you for your patience and wisdom. I will come here and see if I can find you um, and do some questions and answers. Let me see what I can do here in the chat. There you all are. Well, I can see some of you and would be happy to answer your questions if you have some. Great to see you. Okay, let's look and chat and see if I can find something. Um, I'm sorry, but I'm just having to read these for the first time. Okay. Yes, thank you. There are um, several questions here and I appreciate the question. Will, you, is this recorded? It is recorded. So um, just just so you, you know, okay. Um, An interesting and hard question. What do you believe is the future for women in this polarized political world? So here's what I learned from studying these women that could, be, could help us with a path forward. There are many studies which say that um, women are inclined, even as leaders, to collaboration. 
And the uh, studying the women in the United States Senate is certainly there is there are seeds of evidence. Um, unfortunately, it's. Uh, I wish there were more of it, but there are several examples where the women senators have been the ones to come together and figure out um, a solution. We've had budget um, budget log jams where um, uh, we were stuck for weeks, and the women came up with a solution. We've had votes, of course, and you know them, where the Republican women have crossed over to join Democratic women. Um, it's not that often, but it does happen. I think one of the things that helps is that um, my mantra about the work being more important than the hard ideological differences, that's what's at the root of those crossover votes or those collaborative solutions. We have a lot of research from business, um, from MIT that the actual brain work, the thinking work that is done by groups of men and women is greater than the work that single sex groups do in terms of problem solving, in terms of coming up with, with solutions or alternatives. And so I think the more we know about our value, the more we will venture in terms of trying to bring the parties together and the more confident we'll be that that's a useful route. I think it's been a really tough, tough time. So I am hoping that we'll have more opportunity um, to do that. Um, let me see what else. Um, So someone is asking me a related question, which is, are there similar stories in the Republican Party like the one we have here in the Bay Area? First, I just wanna do a shout out to the women of New Hampshire. When I um, boldly state that there's no place else like it in the United States, that is true. But it is also true that New Hampshire did something that no other state has done. For a two year period, every federal office, all there, they have, two, now this is, they had two congresswomen, two senators, and a governor for a two-year period were all women. Um, they all knew each other. They did help each other. Uh, uh, they were, four were Democrats and one was a Republican. Um, and then the Republican was replaced by Democratic Senator um, Maggie Hassan six years ago. So point being, um, this alchemy among women building an infrastructure for women is happening in other places. It didn't happen as, as quickly, as deeply, or with as much energy and cultural assist as we got in the 90s in the Bay Area, but it does happen elsewhere. The lessons are there so that we can figure out how to make it go faster. There is nothing in my experience in the Republican Party, and I also, I will just say, took a great deal of grief for um, in founding something years ago called the 2012 Project, which was a bipartisan effort to get women to run from the private sector to do more government, to take a greater interest in government service at the end of their careers. So when people are retiring between 55 and 65, they have years of wisdom and judgment and you know subject matter expertise they can offer, but government isn't that appealing. So we're trying to build an on-ramp for those you know, gifted women to come into government and help. In that effort, I had great assistance from Republican women who had been in office. But it was very difficult to find um, at the grassroots or within states, Republican women's infrastructure that, that mirrored the Democratic women. And honestly, I, I, I don't hold out a lot of hope in the immediate future. I think there's some business they have to take care of inside to make women welcome. So um, I, we're not at a good place in, for Republican women. Although I will say the 2020 election was the year of the Republican woman. We added more Republican women to our state legislature and to the Congress than in many, many cycles. So there was an effort by Republican women leaders. Condoleezza Rice is part of that effort, I believe, um, and others. 
but uh, so it's there, but it's seedlings, I think it's fair to say. Um, let's see. What advice do we have for um, reading the zeitgeist? How do you read the zeitgeist today? Wow. Um, it's, you know, it struck me as I went back and reviewed all of this history, how very difficult it is to see, to see it when you're in it. Um, and I, uh, you know, particularly hats off to the speaker because I think she has that, she has that third eye and her third eye is really the, the wisdom of her leadership. But um, the, what I, what I would say, um, about understanding the zeitgeist um, is to, and it's, you know, it's not particular to politics. It, it is to read widely, to understand what other people are doing while you're doing what you're doing. Um, and it's to talk to younger people. They pick up the trends first. They start a lot of them. They are really um, aware. Um, you know, we didn't talk a lot uh, but the rise of the women in the Bay Area and some of the um, the the subjects um, uh, in the 1990s, you can find the seeds of our multiculturalism, our embrace of multiculturalism. Uh, in in um, you have to go way back to the 60s, but then if you come forward, there's this rebirth in the 90s that is there, and I think. Um, that's what you're looking for. You're looking for um, the future in the now. Um, and, and I think young people and just remembering to look up from what you do to see what other people do um, is a good way to test what's carrying the day. Um, For women who are running three pieces of advice, the advice comes in part from the lessons. Um, the most important one is your own authenticity. Um, each one of the 11 women who went to Congress or the Senate from the Bay Area is um, an, an, a fully formed um, and, and highly animated individual and they're clear on what they're for, who they're with, why they do this work and what the next hill is they have to take. They are not wondering about things. So you can be authentic when you have nailed that down. You can be persuasive when you know and believe in those things, but those are essential. Those are essential. So that's number one. Number two, um, again, know your people. If, if it's health or if it's environment, if it's kids, if it's choice, whatever it is that you gain personal satisfaction and joy. And I, I, I don't mean that in a, um, in a flibbity gibbet way, but I mean deep satisfaction because the work is hard and it is never ending. So identify what that is for you and commit to it because it, you will be persuasive about it. You will raise money because of it. People will sign up to volunteer because you know what you're, what you're doing. So I, I think it takes on a different, um, there's a different texture to knowing what you're doing when you're talking about from the inside out which is what I'm, I'm talking about. And then um, the third piece is to understand the business. We haven't talked about this at all today. And it is to understand the business of running for office. It has become big business. It involves digital campaigning. It involves hands-on campaigning. It involves building a campaign apparatus. To be in a competitive congressional race or any competitive race, sadly, requires more money than it should. And hopefully we'll take that issue on soon. But till we do, it's a reality. So understand the business of campaigning and your role. You're not the campaign manager. 
You are not in charge of the digital communication. You are the product. You are what they're the message. You are what the whole team is selling. That's hard for some people, especially hard for women who lead because they want to be in charge of everything. And you don't really want to be. You just want to be the best candidate you can be. And this is spoken by someone who's a longtime consultant who has watched the struggles of people who don't learn that lesson. They mostly don't win the first time. Um, so that's those would be my three things, three pieces of advice. And I and we're done. Oh no! Thank <laughs> I was you just so gonna much. Say. So lovely to be with you. Thank you for caring about these issues and these women. Thank you so much. What an enlightening and um, uplifting talk. So thank, thank you, you very much, Mary. Bye, everybody. Have a good day.